Mad Fulton, The End of an Error. After more than 550 issues and 67 years, Mad Magazine is coming to an end, and we're talking exclusively with members of the usual gang of idiots. Today, Mad artist Ray Alma shares his memories and thoughts on the end of Mad. I'm David Levin, and this is Pop Goes the Culture. Our next guest is uh, Ray Alma, who is a uh, an artist and was, has been uh, drawing for Mad Magazine for quite some time, and uh, also currently is working on Stephen Colbert's Arc Cartoon President, and is an instructor at SVA, and has a million things on his resume, and I can't get to all of them. But welcome to the show, Ray. Thanks for having me, Dave. My pleasure. Um, thanks for coming on. You know, you've been working. How long have you been working for Mad Magazine as a as, a, um, as an artist? I started working for them in 1996. Uh, Joe Orlando, uh, longtime EC contributor, right, uh, was one of my teachers at SVA, and he got me he got me into Mad. Wow, that's pretty cool. So, what what was the first thing you worked on? Uh, it was a parody of Lollapalooza. <laughs> that, that they did, and um, even though I was a guy in my 30s at the time, mm-hmm. uh, I was the young guy. So they yeah. were like, oh, <laughs> this is rock and roll. Let's give it to this guy. Um, yeah, so it, it kind of speaks to how old most of the other I- idiots were. At that at been. that point, yeah, Matt, yeah, Matt was around for quite a while. Did Were you a reader as, as a kid? Oh, my God, yes. Um one of my earliest memories actually is looking at uh, copies of um, early post Kurtzman Mads uh, that my mother had as a kid. Wow! So these were some these were some issues from the from the late fifties, um, and it's just like I, I couldn't I couldn't even read at the time, but I distinctly remember. Uh, looking through these magazines, like, like, and, and, and it just—I mean, I don't know if it's bad parenting that you would you would give your your kid Mad Magazine as something to look at early on, but um, it, I mean, it, it it got me where I am today. Well, from what I understand, most parents would would keep it from their kids, and the kids would yeah, hide it yeah. under the bed. So you were you yeah. were lucky to have one of those parents who were supportive enough to uh, to encourage your your corruption early. Well, I think it was more just like. Here, read this and, and leave me alone. <laughs> so, all right. So you start working for Mad Magazine. You meet the guys. You become sort of one of the usual gang of idiots. Uh, you have the honor of drawing me early on. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what? What? And in the last couple of years, obviously things have have, have changed. You know, pop culture has changed. Magazines have changed. Um, Everything has changed, and, and we talked to, I talked to Joe, and I talked to a couple other people. Um, what was your perception of the last couple of years? Because things really sort of took a turn for the magazine industry in general. Um, what was your experience in terms of, in terms of uh, Mad Mag? Um my experience over the last couple of years with yeah i mean mad magazine obviously doesn't when we were growing up the influence of mad magazine was pervasive and then yeah. and now it's sort of you know and it, it you know you would you would sometimes hear people go mad magazine is that being published is yeah. it still being published and now that it's kind of gone people are i guess having an appreciation for it yeah uh yeah no it was i mean it was it was sad um that I, I I would uh, I would do a lot of volunteer stuff where either it was like an organization called the Inkwell where we would go and draw for kids in hospitals mm-hmm. or with um, the USO where we would draw for wounded soldiers and I would introduce myself oh I work for Mad Magazine and I would I would invariably get oh they oh or either. The really young kids didn't even know what it was, mm-hmm. or if somebody was old enough to have been familiar with it, would say, "Oh, that's still being published." Or uh, what I got a lot was uh, people were familiar with the brand from the cartoon that was on. Uh, the, I think it was on Cartoon Network for a couple of years. Right. Also, the uh, TV show was on for a while, although that was not really affiliated. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I, I rarely got anybody making that connection uh, right. with that that 
pseudo SNL show, which I, I actually kind of like. Um, so yeah, so it did, it did make me sad that Mad wasn't as prominent on people's minds, but it is understandable with the decline of print mm-hmm. um, and with the fact that there are so many other avenues for satire these days. Yeah. Uh, SNL being, uh, being like a big thing that uh, I think has surpassed something uh, like Mad, you know, and obviously SNL was inspired by Mad. Um, so people know about that. And then the, the, the um, internet um, memes and stuff like that uh, can provide such an immediate source for satire. Right. Whereas if you had to wait a month for the magazine to come out that took two or three months to put together, you know, you're looking at stuff that's already a few months old and outdated compared to something happens with a celebrity or a politician today. And by the end of the day, people have created memes and gifs about this to reflect the, the humor. Um, you know, so it's no wonder that something like mad was, uh, was falling behind and through, through no fault of mad at all. It's just the sense of uh, just what's happening with print. Right. Well, the other thing is, I think, Mad has a lot of children now. A lot of people who grew up with Mad or loved Mad are now in other positions. I mean, think about Stephen Colbert, who who have pay, who's paid homage to uh, Al Jaffe on a number of yeah. occasions, and now is doing basically using you know people like yourself to do our cartoon president because now you can animate those pictures that you guys used to sort of just draw. Um, and you can do it with a computer, and, and in seconds you have an animated, you know, <laughs> uh, version of of what Mad Magazine would have been. Um, yeah. You know, it sort of put put the whole uh, question of how Mad Magazine happens. But now we've come to a point where uh, DC Comic has made the decision to uh, to to cease publication of original material Mad Mag. How, how did you feel when you when you first? I was I. It was it it was like hearing um, about a relative passing away. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it, it. I mean, I you know, with the with the move to L.A. from New York, I knew it. It took a little bit out of the soul of what the magazine was. But then I was really encouraged when Bill Morrison um, was announced as going to be the editor. I've known Bill for a while, and I, mm-hmm. I felt confident that he could, you know, create something given enough time. And I felt like the magazine was doing some good stuff. But I, I you know, just the nature of print and the fact that they they made the move, it seemed like the handwriting was on the wall. Yeah. But still, it was it was kind of a shock. Now I am I am hearing that it is not completely dead. Um, like the parrot in Mo- Monty Python. Yeah, I'm not exactly. dead yet. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, exactly. right, right, right. Like, uh, or or I, I I I I think more about the scene from uh, Princess but, Bride. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's mostly dead. Um, <laughs> but uh, so so I am I am hearing some conflicting things that there is there is a little life to it. Uh, there are some um, uh, petitions to save Mad. Interesting. Um, you know, and then there's been like this this media notice about the demise mm-hmm. um people like mark hamill have been tweeting about it um so you know i don't know maybe it's not dead maybe maybe dc will take this and think all right maybe we have something valuable that we should keep going well you know we i can th- only hope. uh I don't know if you're a, a comic book fan like i am in terms of oh, following yeah. the comic okay so so I'm thinking about in 1993, 94, somewhere in there, and uh, and Superman's cells had been moribund for a while, and all of a sudden, they killed Superman! Yeah. And for eight months, Superman was basically dead, and all of a sudden, all these people started coming out of the woodwork saying, oh no, we love Superman, you can't kill Superman, Superman, oh, he's an icon. Same thing with Captain America with Marvel a few years ago, oh, you can't yeah. do... You know, people care about the character, even if they're not going to buy it. And I think Mad Magazine, uh, 
for at least for a certain generation was kind of a beloved uh, franchise. And so you hear that that franchise is suddenly gone. Suddenly people start to go, well, that, that meant something to me, you know? And yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's true. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I found it interesting that um, when I, uh, when I started working in animation, doing storyboards, I was still doing some freelance stuff for Mad uh-huh. uh, in the in the in the early two thousands, and um, I was I was in an animation studios full time. Uh, so Mad was sending me monthly issues, even mm-hmm. if I wasn't in the issue. Right. Um, and I would read the issue, and after I was done, I. Um, because I, I, I don't really collect anymore, right. I didn't want to throw it away. So I would I would bring it into the animation studio I was at, and and invariably leave it in the bathroom, for, <laughs> which is which is where it belongs, it. as far as yeah, I'm where it belo- it's it's for some reason it's funniest when you're on the toilet. <laughs> uh, but I was I was always impressed with how these because it was like the people I was working with were always so much younger, uh, kids right out of art school. Right. in their 20s um who r- roughly familiar with it but hadn't really read it and i would and and they would invariably say to me in passing like oh i just i just read the mad you left in the toilet it was hilarious <laughs> can, can you bring more in um so it's like you know if people pick it up and look at it and start to read it they they'll find something that that they like if it either either you know it's great writing or you know, there's there's still fantastic art in there, even when my stuff is in there. That, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> especially Ray, especially. Yes, ex- yeah, exactly. I would I'd bring the level down, but I mean, <laughs> you know, if you looked at some of the uh, some of the the newer art, I mean, the, there's obviously the legends, but some of the newer artists who had been in the magazine over the last few years, uh, Tom Richmond, Herman Mejia, right, uh, right, and and even more recently, uh, my 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 good buddy Ed Steckley. Um, Jason Chatfield, all the like, it just it still brought great talent that uh, that was creating good stuff, and it's just you know I I would like to see that forum still exist. And also, I mean, they used to they used to really uh, compensate their artists fairly well. You know, they would buy out those that, that artwork, which unheard of. I would I say used to. Um, uh, but that kept people loyal to Mad Magazine. There was a loyalty and a family feeling there that not only did they get some of the greatest artists, I mean, some of the greatest artists. You think of Jack Davis, who oh. had, who who still had a huge career in art, in advertising, in, in mo- the movie business, doing posters or Mort Drucker or people like that, but still kept coming back to Mad Magazine, you know, even though they could certainly afford to no longer do Mad Max. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I think, uh, and I think a lot of it was the 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 content that you were able to work on. So, you know, I I I did a lot of magazine illustration mm-hmm. uh, for different magazines, and um, you you could only be so crazy in some of those magazines, and, and animation too, like. Uh, you, because I might, I might be working on uh, doing storyboards for like a, like a very young kids show, and you really couldn't do any, anything uh, creative. And right. then like like Mad gave you this opportunity to just go crazy, and right. it was um, there was very little that was off limits. And most of us loved the chance to follow in someone like Will Elder's shoes, who right. perfected this art of chicken fat, where we could. Um, put the uh, the uh, different visual gags in the background, right? And you know, and that I loved. I never uh, heard it he, called. I never heard it called chicken fat. That's a oh, great. Yeah, yeah. That's a because we'll, we'll, his, they would always have those we'll tiny it. little and Kurtzman also. They would always have these tiny little sort of psychic. You'd have the main story, and then there's yep. like here's little orphan Annie doing something in the corner or something like that. Yeah, that was that was that that, that was Elder. Who would uh, just kind of fill up the space? It was it was stuff that uh, not necessarily was in the script, um, but it was just you know he had this freedom to 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 add these uh, these 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 visuals. So and and that was a tradition that that just came down through the years too. Right. Um, I, I'll and it was it was stuff that I remember reading as a, as a kid. So 
after I saw the uh, the early magazines that my mother gave me, when I when I started buying Mad myself was in the early seventies at its height. Right. So when they were parodying uh, Poseidon Adventure, Towering Inferno, stuff like that, and I would see the the chicken fat that Mort Drucker and Angelo Torres were putting in, and Jack Davis right. putting in the backgrounds of their pieces, and it just it was yeah it would it would it would make you come back to see because you would sometimes miss it, and then you do it back a second or third time, and then you even if it was just like a face or expression, and it's just like like for me. Uh, like the height of it was something like I think it was Mort who drew the, the Towering Inferno, and it was like a scene of chaos going on, and there was just a character on the side who's just kind of making this <laughs> this face like that, and it's just like, and it just cracked me up to just see that how wonderfully rendered this face was of not one of the main characters, just kind of on the side. So yeah, the 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 the, the chicken fat just as an artist was so wonderful to do. Some of that chicken fat or some of the side characters, not, I mean, eventually people sort of sort of figured it out, but a lot of those side characters were often uh, other Mad Magazine contributors, editors, yeah. writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and you. We, and we, me. We, we, I, yes. I, yes, I have to say, I really appreciate it. Okay, quick story. So years ago, when uh, they were doing, when, when uh, TRL, Total Request Live, was on MTV, and, uh, and they were doing a parody, and Desmond Devlin wrote it, and Ray was assigned to draw it. Um, I was working at MTV at the time, and so they thought, well, you know, as one of the background characters, they would put me into the uh, story. So, Ray, you, you took a couple of snapshots of me, and the next thing I know, I was in, uh, in this, this... This was like one of the honors of my life, to be drawn into... A, a mad magazine parody and certainly i didn't know you well then ray but but it was like it was like oh when, did you have to make me that fat um i did not work on trl per se i was working on other stuff i worked on a show called uncensored so i was on the trl set a lot but there was a guy named sam simmons who was uh working on trl at the time and he and i kind of resembled each other and so when the article came out, everyone looked at that and said, saw the picture of me and said, Sam, you're in Mad Magazine. How oh. did they know to put you in? Which oh. was which was hilarious. And I love Sam. He's a great guy. Uh, but but so we both got something out of it at that point. OK, good. Tell me your tell me your uh, your uh, James Gandolfini story. Um, they were uh, shooting an episode of The Sopranos in a very tacky fish restaurant in my neighborhood mm -hmm. when, while, the, while the show was on the air. And I just happened to be walking by, and I, I see the commotion, and I see uh, that there, there's a film s s crew there at this restaurant, and I look, and I see it's it's the it's the whole cast. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, so they were, they were filming like a dinner scene at the restaurant, and there's James Gandolfini. And he was uh, they were taking a break in filming, and he was sitting outside the restaurant and people were coming up and he was signing stuff. And he was really nice. I lived two blocks away and Matt had just done the Sopranos. Mm -hmm. And so they had an issue with Gandolfini and a couple of the other cast members on the cover. And it was like, it was called like gangsters gone wild. So it was <laughs> Gandolfini and the other guys. Uh, Cause it was like girls gone wild. It was the thing where they like all, they pull up their shirts. I remember that. Them. Yeah. Uh, and it was wonderfully illustrated by Drew Friedman. Mm -hmm. And Mad loves to have pictures of celebrities who are in the magazine holding up the magazine. Right. Um, so I was like, oh, I got to I, I went back to my house. I got the issue and I went back down to the restaurant um, to, to show him uh, to get a photo of him holding it up so I can send it to Mad. I knew they would love it. And so, you would and you would get a free subscription then. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I already had the free. No, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm I'm leaving the issues in the in the toilet at the animation studio, so it didn't matter to me. But I just, you know, because, and it's just a way to talk to James Gandolfini. So I go up to, and he was very nice, and he's he's signing autographs. Then I come up to him, and I show him the issue, and he starts, like he's just kind of staring at it at this this Drew Friedman drawing of him on the cover with this huge fat hairy belly, <laughs> the shirt up. And I tell him I work for Mad Magazine. Um, 
you know, you're, it's here in the issue. I was wondering if I can get a picture of you with the issue. He thought I said that I drew the cover. Because <laughs> uh, I think I remember, okay, I remember I said it was like, I draw for Man Magazine here. So, so he thought I drew the cover. And so he looked at it and didn't really say anything. And then he took the issue and he rolled it up tight and he whacked me on the head with it. And he said, why'd you make me so effing fat? And I was just like, but then he smiled. He was, he was, he was kind of cool about it. So after that, I was able to tell people um, I got whacked by Tony Soprano. Okay, that's that. That's the button. It's hilarious. But when you, because it was when you said like, why'd you make me so fat? Right. It's like it was just took me right back to James Gandolfini. Oh, and, and an interesting postscript to this was I, I was going to have him sign it and take it back. But he started looking through it, and there's like the uh, the was the the, the Tom Richmond uh, interior uh, parody, and um, so he starts reading it, and he starts laughing, and they're like they're calling him back to the set. So he took he stole my issue, <laughs> like he didn't, he didn't give it back to me. I wasn't like uh, like oh you can have it, James. He just took it. Celebrities always get back. things for free. Yeah, he just walked back. But then it was what was kind of funny was he called over the other cast members. And they're they're looking at it with him. I can see them, and they're looking over his shoulder, and they're all laughing. They're all like, "Oh, look how he drew you!" So it's like like that was always cool. How celebrities like got such as as much as you got a kick about being in the magazine, the celebrities did too. And yeah. I thought that was fantastic. Ray, any final thoughts? Uh, Mad Magazine going to come back? What do you think? We're in some form I, or another. You know, I yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I it it seems like something that. DC can can monetize in some in some manner, yeah. Um, which I, I think is the bottom line for them. Um, but but beyond that, I mean, in the in the world today, I just I we need it. We we need satire. We need yeah. to be able to laugh. We need to to make fun of things. Um, I mean, I just I just think in general, Mad has to somehow. Um, uh, ad adapt to the world that we live in uh and i i don't know why it's been so slow to do so uh beyond like i think having the the cartoon on cartoon network was a great first step mm -hmm. i think they should go further and just really have much more of an online presence and and be there ready to to meme something when something happens and have it come from ed and there, there has been a little of that um over the years but they just need to give it more emphasis and i think that um, I think that'll be a step to having it survive. And just, I mean, I would still love to see the, the print be something that, that is also there. I Just to, to hold it and, you know, to, to read on the toilet. <laughs> Ray, I think uh, I could not have summed it better. Ray Alma, artist, extraordinaire, humorist, uh, and, uh, and a friend. Thank you so much for, for being on the show, Ray. Thanks for having me, Dave. Take care. You too. Hey, it's David Levin. If you like Pop Goes the Culture and want to see more of it, don't forget to subscribe, click on one of these links, and please help us out on Patreon so that we can keep bringing more Pop Goes the Culture episodes to you.